Hi, and welcome to another philosophy lecture. In this video, I will explain Plato's, one of Plato's uh, most famous dialogues, the Mino. Plato, just briefly, was, uh, was born in Athens. Um, he was the son of a wealthy family. And uh, everybody knows that he was the student of Socrates. He wrote 36 dialogues, uh, like the Mino, and 11 letters. And also he's famous for uh, being the founder of the Academy in Athens, the, the, uh, the first uh, institution of higher education. Now, in one of, in one of the, uh, uh, the dialogues, the Mino, as usual, there's, a, there's Socrates as, a, as the character, the main character. Socrates having a discussion with Mino. Mino is a, uh, a student of Gorgias. Um, Gorgias is a famous sophist. Sophists was, were uh, these private teachers in, uh, in ancient uh, Athens who... Um, uh, were uh, experts in uh, rhetoric. They uh, they taught politicians how to win arguments, uh, and typically, they uh, they taught. Uh, they they endorsed uh, and professed moral relativism. In the dialogue, as you will see, Mino is not as smart as maybe he thinks he is because he doesn't get the point um, what he wants to do is to um, to determine whether virtue can be taught and so he goes through uh, uh, four unsuccessful definitions of virtue Another uh, brief appearance is Anitus, who uh, is also uh, found in the Republic, is one of the, uh, the people who uh, accused Socrates of uh, being um, unreligious and um, corrupting the youth of Athens. He's a, he's a pr prominent politician in Athens. Um, so, as I said, the main theme is virtue, whether virtue is teachable. Virtue, remember, by virtue, what do we mean? We, we mean typically an excellence. Uh, it's interesting because the word virtue is used in the English language uh, as uh, to, um, to denote uh, certain um, good, uh, excellent uh, character traits, for example, compassion, friendliness, courage, justice, fortitude, uh, uh, temperance, and so on. But also, uh, in the English language, we use the, the word uh, virtue, uh, we might use it that way, to, um, to describe a, a um, typically is used uh, in uh, um, in a discussion about, uh, to describe a musician, okay? When we say that, that, a, that a musician, a certain musician is a virtuoso, it has virtue. So, uh, in general, the, the term can be used uh, in terms of uh, excellence. Excellence, for example, an, an excellent pianist, a virtuous pianist, or a virtuous animal. But I think what, what's, what Mino is after uh, is the first meaning, the virtue in the sense of human uh, excellence, character trait excellence. Okay, so uh, Mino starts asking Socrates, is virtue teachable? And Socrates naturally wants to know what the term virtue is. And in all these dialogues, the uh, the interlocutor is always, 
always shocked uh, that Socrates doesn't know. And Socrates says, well, I, I don't know. I don't know if I knew. I wish I knew it. If I knew it, I would be able to explain it. But that's, uh, that's exactly the purpose of philosophy, to inquire and to investigate and to find out what these terms mean, if they mean something. Let me know, uh, says, I, do, I don't know. Uh, so Socrates asks him to, uh, to define virtue. First, let's agree on, uh, on a definition, and then we can talk from there. So the first definition that Mino gives is that virtues are many and different. There are virtues of men to administer the state, virtue of women uh, to order the house. Um, we can talk about virtues, virtuous horses, what are their virtue is, to be strong, to be fast. Uh, soldiers can be virtues, virtuous, and so on. So virtues are many, and many people are, are virtuous. Okay, now, Socrates is not satisfied by this definition because this definition only says that there are many different virtues, and people are virtuous in different ways. There are slaves, virtuous slaves, virtuous soldiers, children, etc. But what is virtue? That is my question. Suppose I ask you, for example, what is the nature of a bee? And you answer that there are many kinds of bees. That is not an answer. What a bee is doesn't explain what it is. Uh, but do bees differ? as bees because there are many and different kinds of them, or are they not rather to be distinguished by some other quality, as for example, uh, beauty, size, or shape? How would you answer me, Mino? And Mino says, no, uh, bees do not differ from one another as bees. They're all bees. Well, then, when you say, Mino, that there is one virtue of a man and another virtue of a woman and another virtue of a child and so on, does this mean and apply only to virtue? Or would you say that uh, the same applies to health and size and strength? <clears throat> or is the nature of health always the same, whether in a man or a woman or in a horse Mina responds that they are the same in men and women, of course. But he says that in the case of virtue, it is quite different. But why, Socrates says? You said that men order the state and women order the house, right? Sure. But when they do that, when each one the woman and the man uh, do their jobs, their functions. Don't they both do it with temperance, with moderation, and uh, with justice? They, uh, they order the, the, the house justly. They order the state justly. So to be a good man and a good woman must have the same virtues of temperance and justice, for example. And temperance and justice, I don't think you, you will want to say, Mino, that they are different for different people. And, and if this is true, this is right, okay, then all men are good in the same way and by participation in the same virtue, the virtue of justice, and the virtues of temperance and so on. And they surely would not have been good in the same way unless they, their virtue had been the same. Do you agree? So Mino says, fine, okay. Virtue is the rule over other people. That's what a virtue is, 
to rule over other people. But then, according, Socrates says, according to you, according to this definition, a virtuous child, for example, is, is a child who rules over his parents. That seems wrong. What about a slave? A virtuous slave, that would be absurd. It would be one who rules over his master. So, based on that definition, we should all be rulers then. Even those who rule must rule over others, again, justly. Otherwise, tyrants would be virtuous. We would say that tyrants are virtuous. Dictators are virtuous, according to this definition. Well then, <clears throat> Mino offers a third definition. Aha, justice. Then, here's what I'm going to say, that justice is virtue. But wait a minute, Mino. Is justice virtue or a virtue? Mino doesn't seem to understand in the dialogue. So Socrates explains, if I asked you what is color and what is shape, and you answered red, blue, triangle, square, right? Um, that's not what I asked you. Okay, Socrates, then what is shape? Shape is what always comes with color. There's no shape without color. You see, I gave you a definition. Color is a stream of particles that come from objects and allow visions, vision to happen. In fact, you cannot see anything without color, right? Can you see something without color or that is not a color? Shape without color is the limit of a solid. This is the kind of answer I expect, Mino. Can we move on now? What is virtue, Mino? Well, Mino, I'm not sure if he understands, but now he proposes a fourth definition. Virtue is to desire beautiful or honorable things and have the power to attain them. Now Socrates says, wait a minute, now your definition, your fourth definition is interesting, but it makes two points. Point A, virtue is to desire beautiful things. And virtue, point B, is knowing how to get them. Now, with regard to A, what sorts of things are beautiful and honorable? Do you mean that beautiful and honorable things are things that are beneficial? We can't say they are good. But everybody desires beautiful things then. So everybody is virtuous. And Mino says, no, 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 no. Some people desire what is harmful, not what is good and what is beautiful. Socrates says, yes, you're wrong, because no one would knowingly choose or desire what is harmful to oneself. Think about, for example, people who, uh, uh, say, smoke cigarettes or drink a lot, Mino would say, right? But Socrates says, but no, those people desire smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol because they think that those things are good, so they are ignorant. If they knew that those things were bad, they would not desire them. 
Now, what about point B? Knowing how to get these things. Well, many things are beneficial, and people often know how to acquire them. Uh, the problem is that people commit crimes in order to uh, obtain what's beneficial to them. Robbing banks to obtain money, for example, is beneficial to uh, the robbers. But is that virtuous? It doesn't seem that way. So knowing how to get certain things that are beneficial cannot possibly be ben uh, virtuous. Perhaps here Mino, by accident, stumbled upon something very important, but he doesn't understand that. Perhaps virtue is the ability to discern what is really beneficial and what is not beneficial for, for a person. Here at this point, Mino gets frustrated and he says, Socrates, you're like one of those torpedo fish that makes you numb if it touches you. In other words, you confuse people. But Socrates says, I don't want to confuse people. But in, in any case, being confused is not bad because if you are confused about something, you are realizing that you're learning something and you are... Uh, you're thinking about that, whatever that might be, in a different light. So now that we both acknowledge our ignorance, let's find virtue. But here is a, what is known as Mino's paradox. Mino says, it is pointless inquiring into anything because you don't know what, what to look for and you wouldn't recognize it if you found it anyway. So, for example, if I tell you, uh, let's, let's try to understand the nature of Glork. But how can we know the nature of Glork if we don't know where Glork is? Even if we stumble upon it, even if we run, um, we hit our heads against it, we wouldn't be able to, uh, to know that that's the Glork. Socrates says that that's not true. See, this is an interesting aspect of Plato's metaphysics. Plato and Socrates very likely argue that knowledge, knowing something, is possible because before we were born, our soul, before it entered our body, our soul was eternal and uh, existed in, a, in, the, uh, in the world, in the real world. Uh, remember from my, my lecture on Plato's metaphysics that Plato sees the reality as two different parts. One is the, the sensible world, this world where we find tangible objects, uh, which is a copy, a fake world, an illusion. And then the real world, which is an intelli the intelligible world, the world that we understand through our reason. And so the soul, before it entered the body, existed in uh, the intelligible world, and so it was acquainted with, uh, with knowledge with forms and things. But then it, it, when, uh, when it entered the body, it forgot. And so uh, the, pro the, uh, the process of learning, knowledge, is nothing but recollection. And so uh, Socrates here says, even many wise priests and priestesses and also poets talk about the learning process as recollection from a past existence, past life. Perhaps the soul is uh, it already acquainted with knowledge. So when you find something, you will remember it. 
when you see it. Mino doesn't believe it. Prove it, Socrates. And here's the famous, the famous um, experiment that Socrates does with a, with a slave, with a, a young slave. So Socrates uh, says, I'll prove it to you. you um, let me uh, talk to your uh, slave boy. And I'll show you that he knows geometry. Okay. Now this is a square. Okay. So Socrates draw that on the sand and uh, it leads the slave boy to uh, the right answer. Now this is a, a square. Let's say that this square is four units. Uh, the area is four units. <clears throat> okay. Now, if I want to double the area, what do I do? Well, that is double. Okay. Um, I have to, uh, well, this, at first the slave says, well, I have to double uh, the, uh, the sides. Okay. But now, you see, when you double the size, this is what you get. You get a square that has 16 units. So it's not, it's not the double of four units. So um, what you have to do, perhaps, the slave says, is that you need uh, one more unit. But if you add one more unit, you see, what do you get? Three, six, <clears throat> and nine units, which is not double of four. Now, Socrates says, think about this now. What if we divide this square in a half? Now, you notice that you have one and two units on this side and two units on this side. Now, let's draw another square, okay? And let's divide it in half again. And another one, and another one, and another one. And there you go. Now you have, or you can do it in, in, a, in another way, by the way. You can, uh, by the way, uh, divide uh, the square twice like this and build uh, triangles, four triangles on each side, okay, like, like this, and, w and you double, you double the square. But the point is that this, the slave boy was able to see, to tell Socrates uh, that by extending, by doing this operation of splitting the, the square in half, uh, what you get in, is the actual double, okay, which has 16, um, I'm sorry, eight units, which has eight units. Okay. Consequently, Socrates says, I just demonstrated to you that it is possible to know something uh, even if you don't know what you're looking for. So now let's move on. But Mino, at this point, is tired and says, no, 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 I'm not playing your game anymore. You have to tell me now, is virtue teachable? End of the story. I won't accept any more games. <clears throat> Socrates says, well, it seems that all knowledge is teachable. If virtue is knowledge, there is a good chance that it is teachable. But is it knowledge? What attribute of the soul must be virtue if it is to be teachable or not? 
it must be some form of knowledge, something that leads to success in action, and thus make it makes us good. And it is advantageous to us. Things that we consider advantageous are, for example, health, strength, good looks, wealth. All these things can lead to harm, however, if they are not used properly. And the same is true of courage, temperance, wit, memory, right? Dr. Evil, you don't want Dr. Evil to be uh, courageous, temperate, um, funny, uh, intelligent, have a good memory. So these things can be used uh, for bad purposes. So everything that human spirit undertakes will lead to happiness when guided by wisdom. Okay, So it's not enough to have health, strength, and so on but you need a wisdom. Oh boy, now they're opening a can of worms because what is wisdom? But anyway, but the opposite when, when guided by folly. So virtue then must be in whole or in part wisdom. And it can't come by nature because you are not born wise. No one is born wise. And if virtue is wisdom, and wisdom is knowledge, then it follows that virtue can be taught. If you want to learn any discipline, now, what do you do? You go to school, you go to a teacher, right? Every discipline that is knowledge can be taught. So if virtue is knowledge, and knowledge can be taught, then your answer is right there. Virtue must be teachable. But here's the problem, Mina. Where are the teachers of virtue? Where are they? People pay teachers to teach virtue to their children, like the sophists. But why don't they succeed? At least not all. Now Anitus appears in a dialogue and says, Wait, well, Socrates, why don't you talk to any gentleman, gentleman on the streets of Athens? Remember, he's a politician, so he's proud of Athens. He says, That's where you're going to learn virtue. There are many teachers. And Socrates says, but Anitus, have these gentlemen been good teachers of their own virtue? Think about it. And Socrates here gives examples of virtuous, well-respected men whose very children have turned out to be less than perfect. Themistocles, Pericles, Thucydides, these are all people who uh, were not very virtuous. So in each case, the fathers taught their sons to be uh, um, virtuous, but they, but they failed. So if virtue could be taught at all, it would have to be it would have been in, the, in these cases where great men, great recognized virtuous individuals taught their children. And yet, this apparently did not happen. So perhaps we should conclude that, that virtue cannot be taught. So even if even though we concluded earlier that virtue is at least partly a kind of wisdom, though not necessarily knowledge, it would now appear that virtue cannot be taught at all. And therefore, if it cannot be taught, it is not knowledge. 
This last point suggests Socrates is one reason why he and Mino may have failed to find virtue itself in considering such virtuous men. This suggestion puzzles Mino, and Socrates explains that while they have, they have been looking for virtue as a kind of teachable knowledge, virtuous man, they perform good deeds. Um, they could, and, and those deeds could be the result not of knowledge, but of true opinion. For example, I can tell you uh, how to get to a certain uh, store in Rome, although I, I have never been to Rome before. So I don't have knowledge of Rome, but I have a true opinion of Rome. I read about it, and I know about it. That's a possibility. So in other words, Virtue is not knowledge because it cannot be taught. But then, Mino says, I cannot believe, Socrates, that there are no good men, no virtuous men. And if there are, how do they come into existence? Where do they acquire virtue in the first place? And Socrates explains that because to be good or virtuous, a virtuous person, one need not have knowledge. That's the conclusion. What do you mean? I mean, if a man knew the way to Larissa or anywhere else and went to the place and led others thither, would he not be a right and good guide? That's what I just said before. <clears throat> I can tell you how to get to a place in Rome, or how to get to Rome, although I had never been there. Certainly, that would be a good guide. Then, Socrates says, and a person who had a right opinion about the way, but had never been and did not know, might be a good guide also. Then, true opinion is as good a guide to correct action as knowledge. And that was the point which we omitted in our speculation about the nature of virtue. When we said that knowledge only is the guide of right action. No, it's not only the only uh, guide. There's also right opinion. What's the difference between knowledge and true opinion? Well, true opinion, you know what is true. Knowledge, you know what is true and why, and you can see it. Uh, now, for a better explanation, go back to my video on Plato's uh, metaphysics, where I explain the difference between uh, knowledge and opinion. Socrates and Mino have concluded that virtue cannot be taught. Virtue is not innate. Virtuous individuals are only so than because they are inspired by the gods. So it is the gods that confer upon humans certain virtues. They inspire them. They too say many true things when inspired, but they have no knowledge of what they are saying. A gift from a gods, that's what, what, it, what, it, what it is, which is not accompanied by the understanding. Okay? The, and this is how you explain the existence of many virtuous men, or many, many men who uh, know, who are good and can... Uh, be good guides. And this is the end of the Mino. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next lecture.